What up, y'all? This is your boy, Mr. Downtown Ray Mello, and you're listening to the Entertainment Report on iHeartRadio, live from Dubai for Monday, January 18th, 2016, delivering some major stories and trends going on in the world of entertainment and beyond. You can follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, facebook.com slash the Entertainment Report with Ray Mello, that's R-A-Y-M-E-L-O, on Twitter at the Enter Report, or on Instagram at the Entertainment Report. You can listen to the show anytime you want on iHeartRadio. Just go to iHeartRadio. Dot com or your iHeart phone app, search for the Entertainment Report, and I'll take you to the page. I hope everyone had a fantastic weekend. Saturday Night Live alum Fred Armisen returned to the show this weekend to pay tribute to David Bowie, who died January 10th at the age of 69. Armisen appeared near the end of the episode, which was guest hosted by Star Wars The Force Awakens actor Adam Driver, and explained how influential Bowie was to him as an artist. Armisen told the audience, when I was in high school and living in Long Island, I stayed up to see David Bowie play on Saturday Night Live. And watching him was, for me, a life-changing experience. He had these backup singers that were like choir singers from the future, and to- a toy poodle with a TV monitor in his mouth. David Bowie transformed whatever space he was in, whatever medium he was using, and that night, for me, he transformed live television. Armisen then introduced a clip of Bowie performing The Man Who Sold the World on the show in 1970. Singer Adam Lambert has been cast in Fox's upcoming television remake of the cult classic musical The Rocky Horror Picture Show. Announced Thursday, the American Isle runner-up will star as Eddie, the former motorcycle-riding delivery boy first played by singer Meatloaf in 1975's original film. Eddie was Northworthy for performing the song Hot Patootie, Bless My Soul. Lambert joins a growing cast that includes Victoria Justice and Ryan McCartan as sweethearts Janet Weiss and Brad Majors, along with Orange is the New Black actress Lavelle. Vern Cox, who was cast as mad scientist Dr. Frankenfooter. Lambert said in a statement, I grew up watching Rocky Horror, but could never imagine that I would be part of this new vision. Rocky Horror always made me feel like it was okay to celebrate my weirdness. Hallelujah, bless my soul. I love that old time rock and roll. Directed and choreographed by high school musical Helmer Kenny Ortega, the two hour special is set to air this fall on Fox. Matthew Perry confirmed he will not appear as expected alongside his former Friends co-star for an upcoming NBC tribute to director James Burroughs. Perry's publicist Lisa Kassler told Us Weekly Thursday that the actor will be rehearsing for his London play The End of Longing at the time of the Burroughs TV special will be taped. Perry further explained on Britain's The Graham Norton show on Friday night, it's not the reunion everyone is hoping for. They are celebrating Jim Burroughs, who was a director of Friends. He also added, the other five are going to be on this special, and I'm going to introduce them from London. I'm doing the play here, so I can't be there. Perry, who now is the co-star of the U.S. sitcom The Odd Couple, also played a Friends tribute game during his visit to Norton's chat show. Starring Courtney Cox, Jennifer Aniston, Lisa Kudrow, Matt LeBlanc, and David Schwimmer, the New York set comedy Friends ran for 10 seasons from 1994 to 2004. NBC's Robert Greenblatt said Wednesday when he announced plans for the Burroughs special at the 2016 Television Critics Association Winter Press Tour in Pasadena, hoping that all six of them will be in the same room at the same time. But I'm not sure we can logistically pull that off. Fans and reporters frequently pestered the Friends veterans about the possibility of a reunion movie or limited television revival, but the stars have said for years that is very unlikely to happen. Cox, Aniston, and Kudrow did, however, reunite for a one-off Friends sketch on Jimmy Kimmel Live in 2014. Fox says it has ordered the pilot 24 Legacy, but the possible new drama series will not feature Kiefer Sutherland reprising his iconic role of U.S. counter-terrorist unit agent Jack Bauer. The first installment in the proposed spinoff is to be shot this winter. No casting has been announced yet. The television network said in a press release Friday the pilot will feature an all-new cast of characters and retain the real-time pulse-pounding fast-paced format with split screens and complex interweaving storylines with each episode representing one hour of an eventful day. The project will revolve around a military hero's return to the U.S. and the trouble that follows him back, compelling him to ask the CTU for help in saving his life and stopping what potentially could be one of the largest scale terror attacks on American soil. Howard Gordon, Manny Cotto, and Evan Katz are serving as executive producers of the project, which will be produced by 20th Century Fox Television, Imagine Television, and Gordon's Teakwood Lane Productions. 20 
24 originally premiered on November 6, 2001 and was nominated for a total of 73 Emmy Awards during his eight-season run, winning the Emmy for Outstanding Drama Series in 2006. Sutherland garnered seven Emmy Award nominations and won one for Outstanding Lead Actor in a Drama Series. The most recent chapter in the franchise, 24 Live Another Day, was a 12-episode event series that premiered in the summer of 2014 on Fox, reunited series stars Sutherland, Marilyn Rasp. Rub, Kim Raver, and William Devane. The limited series was both a critical and ratings hit, garnering three Emmy Awards. Scream Queens has been renewed for a second season. Fox confirmed it in a press release after Fox Television Group Chairman Gary Newman and Dana Walden announced the news at the Television Critics Association Winter Press Tour Friday. Season 2 will be set in a hospital where, quote, some of the most fascinating and bizarre medical cases are under observation. Newman denied the series will bear a resemblance to Season 2 of series creator Ryan Murphy's show American Horror Story. He told reporters, I don't think it's anything like Asylum, which was set in a period. The medical is an incredibly rich area to tell stories in. Ryan has always loved the medical area. Nip Tuck was a show he really enjoyed the creative on. It seemed like a great broad area. Season 1 starred Emma Roberts, Skylar Samuels, Leah Michelle, and Abigail Breslin as sorority sisters with Jamie Lee Curtis as University Dean Kathy Munchkin. Walden said Murphy intends to bring some of the actors from the first installment back, possibly as the same characters. Newman also added, it really hasn't been decided who's coming back. Our instinct is that at least a few of the characters will be back with the same actors playing the same roles, but it will be anthological in that there will be a time jump and it will be a different season. Michelle, who plays Hester on Scream Queens, and previously starred on Murphy's series Glee appeared to hint at her return while expressing excitement about the renewal on Twitter. She wrote, OMG, I can be happier right now at Scream Queens season two. This is the best news ever. We're back. Hashtag here comes Hester. Scream Queens premiered in September and completed a 13 episode first season December 8th. The series won favorite new TV comedy at the People Choice Awards this month and Curtis was nominated for best actress in the musical or comedy series at the Satellite Awards. Australian filmmaker George Miller says he already has screenplays for two more Mad Max movies, but isn't sure when the sequels might make it into theaters. The latest entry in the franchise Fury Road, which was nominated for 10 Oscars Thursday. The post-apocalyptic blockbuster is up for Best Picture, Director, Cinematography, Costume Design, Film Editing, Makeup and Hairstyling, Production Design, Sound Editing, Sound Mixing and Visual Effects. Uh, the... Writer, director, producer said in a statement upon hearing his not a film had the second most Oscar nominations behind The Revenant, which earned 12. Wally Zoe, so many talented people labor mightily to bring this movie to the screen. It's lovely that the Academy has acknowledged our work this way. A week earlier, Miller spoke to UPI by phone about the future of the franchise. He explained, we have two other stories. I don't know when I'll get time to do them. We're just having the conversation. One of the other benefits of the delay between Fury Road and its predecessor, 1985's Beyond Thunderdome, is that we dug up deep into the backstory, not only of the characters, but even, for instance, the guy with the guitar. How that guitar came about, how each of the vehicles came about, how their gestures and behaviors came about. So it is a very, very examined world in terms of what we were able to achieve. And I think that uh, that gets onto the screen by some sort of osmosis. So the answer... Short answer is yes, we have two other stories and we are certainly having conversations about them, but I'm not sure when we will go back into the wasteland. Asked if he would like to take a break from the world and turn his attention to something lighter before tackling another Mad Max, the Happy Feet and Babe filmmaker laughed and replied, yes, something relatively quick and not as complex. These are technically complex movies. In order to pull them off, they have to be very highly prepared and so on. That applies to every movie, but something, whether it is sweet and light, but just something smaller in a scale and something that would take as long to do. Danish actress Connie Nielsen has been cast as Hippolyta, the titular heroine's mother in the upcoming Wonder Woman. Variety reports the casting news Friday, but offered no other details about how the Queen of the Amazons will fit into the overall storyline. Patty Jenkins is directing the movie, which is set to hit theaters June 23, 2017. The ensemble also includes Gail Gadot, Chris Pine, Danny Houston, Robin Wright, David Thewlis, and Ewan Brenner. 
Nielsen is known for her work in The Devil's Advocate, Gladiator, The Hunted, The Great Raid, and Three Days to Kill. She also has recurring roles on TV's The Following and The Good Wife. The fact that none of the acting nominees for this year's Oscars are people of color has not escaped Chris Brock's notice. The comedian who is to host the February 28th ceremony honoring excellence in cinema for 2015 tweeted alongside a video promo Friday, the hashtag Oscars, the white BET Awards. The BET Awards recognize the best in entertainment by African-American artists. Nominations for the Oscars were announced Thursdays. Among the omissions were the black stars of the critically acclaimed films such as Straight Outta Compton, Creed, Concussion, Beast of No Nation, and Tangerine. Also surprisingly snubbed this year were celebrated white filmmakers Steven Spielberg, Quentin Tarantino, Todd Haynes, and Ridley Scott, as well as actors Michael Keaton, Tom Hanks, and Johnny Depp. The officer in charge of the CIA's Benghazi base on the night of four Americans were killed during the attacks in 2012 says 13 hours, a big scream account of the events is inaccurate. A source identified only as Bob told the Washington Post he did not instruct his security team to stand down rather than attempt to rescue U.S. diplomats under siege nearby. The high-ranking operative insisted there never was a stand-down order. At no time did I ever second-guess that the team would depart. Bob says he decided to speak up now because because he thought he would regret it if he didn't. He went on to say, so much of this information has been wrong. Helmed by Michael Bay, 13 Hour stars James Badge Dale, John Krasinski, Max Martini, and Toby Stevens. It is based on a book co-written by Mitchell Zuckoff and U.S. contractors hired to protect the CIA base in Benghazi. The movie was number four at the box office when it opened this weekend, earning $16 million in receipts after critics panned the action drama. Zuckoff told The Post he stands by the depiction of the events in his book. He said, I think the evidence is extremely strong that the guy's account is far more credible than that of the CIA's base chief, adding that the agency's rebuffed his numerous requests to speak with Bob. Ridley Scott says Alien Covenant will be rated R and have at least one major gross-out scene. The 78-year-old English director revealed as much to reporters backstage at the Golden Globe Awards last Sunday. The interview has since made the rounds among excited fans hoping for an intense new installment in the sci-fi horror franchise. Scott said of fan demand, that's why I'm doing it. I'm going to do a pretty hard R. Be pretty tough. I always remember doing the very first Alien, the kitchen scene when John Hurt starts to bring up his breakfast. That moment made me realize how pretty scary the film was. He recalled the chest-bursting scene with Hurt as Kane. The reaction of people, I felt a sense of responsibility had I gone too far because it was extreme. I'm going to try to do that this again this year, but much worse. 20th Century Fox announced Scott will direct the Prometheus sequel in November, saying that the movie will follow the colony ship Covenant as it explores a dark, dangerous world inhabited by the synthetic David, played by Michael Fassbender. Scott later confirmed to the rap the film will also link to Alien. The director said they're going they're going to the planet where the engineers came from and come across the evolving creature that they have made. Why they why did they have to make it? Why did they make such a terrifying beast? It felt biomechanoid, it felt like a weapon. And so the movie will explain that and reintroduce the alien back into it. Scott directed the original nineteen seventy nine movie Alien starring Sigoni Weaver, which was followed by sequel. Aliens, Aliens 3, and Aliens Resurrection. He returned to the helm in the 2012 prequel Prometheus starring Fassbender and Naomi Repace. Scott last released The Martian starring Matt Damon, which was nominated for seven Academy Awards, including Best Picture and Best Actor. The director is also slated to helm a TD, TV adaptation of Richard Preston's book The Hot Zone. Prison Break will return as an ultimate escapist event series in 2016. Fox confirmed as much in the press release after Fox Television Group Chairman Gary Newman and Dana Walden announced the news at the Television Critics Association Winter Press Tour Friday. Series creator Paul T. Shigering will serve as showrunner with original executive producers Marty Adelstein and Don Olmstead to also return. Wentworth Miller and Dominic Purcell will reprise Michael Schofield and Lincoln Burroughs, despite Michael's apparent death in the TV movie Prison Break, The Final Break. Newman acknowledged... 
We all who watched the show and I love it thought that Michael had died. Pershing came in with the great twist that explains that he didn't die and what he's been doing in the interim. Walden added, the story unravels on an international landscape. It's not a domestic show. I'm hoping we see many of the great characters from that season return throughout the season. It has all the twists and turns you've come to expect from that show. Newman didn't know if other details like Michael's brain tumor will be addressed, but said the revival will begin shooting in April. The limited series is expected to broadcast during the 2016-2017 television season and will consist of 8 to 10 episodes. Prison Break originally had a four-season run from 2005 to 2009. The series begins with Michael helping Lincoln escape from prison and follows the brothers through Michael's subsequent imprisonment and dealing with the Sinister Company. Miller and Purcell presently played Leonard Snard, a.k.a. Captain Cold, and Mick Rory, a.k.a. Heat Wave, on the CW series The Flash and will reprise the roles on spin-offs DC's Legends of Tomorrow. The new show co-stars Katsy Lotz and will premiere January 21st. Fuller House released a new teaser starring Candace Cameron Burr on Friday. The preview shows the cast ensemble to help DJ Tanner, played by Burr, move her sons and belongings back to into dad Danny Tanner's, played by Bob Saget's house. The footage is the first to feature the returning Full House stars and new actors. Joey Sweden appears as DJ's sister Stephanie Tanner, with Andrea, Andrea Barber as DJ's best friend Kimmy Gibbler, John Stables as Uncle Jesse, Lori Lofkin as Aunt Becky, and Dave Coulier as Uncle Joey. Newcomer Michael Champion plays DJ's eldest son Jackson with Elias Harger's middle son Max and Dashiell and Fox Mesnet as youngest son T- Tommy. So and Nicole Bringus plays Kimmy's teenage daughter Ramona. Fuller House is a sequel series to Full House and will premiere February 26 on Netflix. The show follows an adult and widow DJ as she raises her sons with the help of Stephanie, Kimmy, and her friends and family. Bird told Entertainment Tonight of DJ's parenting styles. She's a bit like Danny Tanner as a dad. She's very organized and orderly. She's a single mom, so she kind of has to be with three kids. And she's the mom in the group in every way between Kimmy and and Stephanie. She also added she's just a little more straight-laced than everyone else, and the other girls kind of loosen her up along the way. I can honestly say that every scene with Andrea Barber and Joey Sweden and the Le- Legacy cast, they are forever just a huge part of my heart and just so much fun. Full House originally had an eight-season run from 1987 to 1995 on ABC. Canadian singer-songwriter Celine Dion is mourning the loss of another important man in her life. Her brother Daniel died of cancer Saturday in a palliative care residence outside Montreal, the CBC reported. The eighth of 14 children was 59. News of his death comes two days after his Grammy Award-winning sister's husband, Renee Angelie, succumbed to throat cancer. Angelie's funeral is to take place in Montreal Friday, while viewing will be held the following day for Daniel. Celine Dion... Uh, has temporarily postponed shows from her Las Vegas residency as she recovers from the back-to-back losses. Rapper Mose Def has been ordered to leave South Africa because he allegedly overstayed the tourist visa he obtained in 2013. The Department of Home Affairs told the BBC the 42-year-old artist who was born, born Dante Smith must leave the country by the end of the month. He reportedly was held at Cape Town International Airport on Thursday after trying to leave the country with unrecognized papers he described as a world passport. A statement by the Department of Home Affairs said further investigation into the matter revealed that Mr. Smith's wife, mother, and four children had overstayed and were sojourning in the country illegally. Uh, Depp's film credits include The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Be Kind Rewind, and The Italian Job. Former television actor Dustin Diamond began his four-month jail sentence in Wisconsin Friday night. TMZ confirmed the one-time Saved by the Bell cast member has checked into the uh, Akoski County Jail. After his release, the 39-year-old actor will be placed on probation for 15 months. Diamond was found guilty in May for carrying a concealed weapon and disorderly conduct with a concealed weapon. He was cleared of felony reckless endangerment charges. The actor was accused of stabbing Casey Smedded during an altercation involving Diamond's fiancée, Amanda Schultz, in December 2014. Sean Penn has spoken out about his meeting with the notorious drunk kingpin Joaquin at Chapo Guzman and allegations made by Mexican authorities that he visited, his visit led to his recapture. Guzman, who was arrested on January 8th following his escape from Mexican prison, met with Penn and Mexican actress Kate Del Castillo 
at, in October for an article the actor was writing for Rolling Stone magazine. In an interview with 60 Minutes correspondent Charlie Rose set to air this Sunday, Penn held nothing back denying any involvement in Guzman's recapture and how he is being unfairly targeted by the Mexican government. Penn said, there's a, this myth about the visit that we made, my colleagues and I with El Chapo, that it was, as the Attorney General of Mexico is quoted, essential to his capture. We had met with him many weeks earlier on October 2nd in a place nowhere near where he was captured. He continued by saying, here's the things that we know. We know that the Mexican government, they were clearly very humili humiliated by the notion that someone found him before they did. Well, nobody found him before they did. We didn't. We're not smarter than the DEA or the Mexican intelligence. We had a contact upon which we were able to facilitate an invitation. Penn believes Mexican officials are pinning to arrest on him in order to put him in the crosshairs of Guzman's drug attack. Cartel. Rose asked, Are you fearful for your life? Penn replied, No. The Academy Award winning actor then lamented about his article and how its original purpose has been overlooked due to the conversation that has sprung up about how the piece led to Guzman's capture. Penn said of his thought process behind wanting to conduct the interview, This is somebody who, upon whose interview, could I begin a conversation about the policy of the war on drugs? That was my simple idea. I have a regret that the entire discussion about this article ignored its purpose, which was to contribute to this discussion about the policy on the war on drugs. He also added, let's go to the big picture of what we all want. We all want this drug problem to stop. We all want them, the killings in Chicago, to stop. We are the consumers. Whether you agree with Sean Penn or not, this is a complicity there. And if you are in the moral right or on the far left, just as many of you children are doing these drugs, and how much time have they spent in the last week since this article comes out talking about that? 1%? I think that'd be generous. As Penn has now discussed his meeting with Guzman, actress Castillo has promised to speak on the matter soon, writing on Twitter Wednesday. Not surprisingly, many of who have chosen to make up items they think will make good stories and that aren't truthful. I look forward to sharing my story with you. Zoe Kravitz and mom Lisa Bonet starred in a stunning new Calvin Klein ad. The 27-year-old actress and her 48-year-old mother look more like sisters in a shot for the 2016 Calvin Klein Watch Plus Jewelry campaign. The brand wrote on Instagram, Mother-daughter moments, actress and musician at Lisa Isabella Kravitz and mother actress Lisa Bonet. Life in the now... Hashtag CK Minute. Calvin Klein released a statement saying the ads are meant to highlight the, uh, the immediacy of time and the richness of relationships. Actor Will Pelt and modder Kenya Kinski, models John Hain and Tilla Lindstam, and models Kim Woo Bin and Zhao Wen Ju also posed for the campaign. Kravitz's daughter to Bonet and musician Lenny Kravitz, who were married from 1987 to 1993. The actress cited Bonet as an inspiration for Mad Max Fury Road while discussing her parents with Essence magazine in May. Uh, she said, I've been raised by the most badass woman in the world. People compare me to my parents all the time, but I can't pay attention to it. I love my parents. I don't feel pressure at all. I'm supportive of them, and they're supportive of me, and we love each other. Kravitz played Toast in Mad Max Fury Road and were prize Christina in the Divergent series Allegiant and sequel Ascendant. She is also slated for Vienna and the Phantoms with Dakota Fanning and HBO series Big Little Lies with Nicole Kidman. Bonet is best known for playing Denise. Hustable Kendall on The Cosby Show and its spinoff A Different World. She has since portrayed Maya Daniels on Life on Mars and Sky Van Dernveen on The Red Road starring husband Jason Momoa. Weezer will release a new self-titled album in April. The Los Angeles-based band announced a record which is also being called the White Album and an accompanying U.S. tour on their website Thursday. The group wrote, Our, self, our new self-titled album will be out April 1st. This is not a joke and we're going on tour this summer. This is also not a joke. Weezer will kick off the tour June 10th in the Woodlands, Texas and bring the venue to a close August 6th in Irvine, California. Pad the Disco will co-headline with special guest Andrew McMahon in the wilderness. Frontman Rivers Cuomo of the a set of the new record. The album will inspire was inspired by my experiences hanging out around the west side of Los Angeles, which has been our home since Weezer began. Hanging out with people in Venice and Santa Monica. 
the beach, the hair, Hare Krishnas, the silk on roller blades with the guitars, girls on Tinder with a four mile radius, seeing other bands, etc. He also added, I would just tweet out, does anybody want to hang? And then I'd get together with people who respond and talk about life. I want the album to have a Beach Boys sort of vibe to make you feel like you were there with us so-called SoCal weirdos, even if you're in Milwaukee in December. We used to release a music video for the new singer King of the World the same day, which was which will appear on the album with Thank God for Girls and Do You Want to Get High? The band, the band last released Everything Will Be Alright in the End in 2014, which peaked at number five on the Billboard 200 albums charts. The Ice Cube Kevin Hart comedy Ride Along to it has dethroned Star Wars The Force Awakens as the number one movie in North America, Run Track announced Sunday. The Force Awakens was the top movie in the U.S. and Canada for the last four weekends. Ride Along scored $34.1 million during its opening weekend. Coming in number two for the period uh, of this weekend is The Revenant with $29.5 million, following by The Force Awakens at number three with $25.1 million. 13 Hours, The Secret Soldiers of Benghazi came in at number 4 with $16 million, and Daddy's Home at number 5 with $9.3 million. Rounding up the top tier are Norm of the North at number 6 with $6.7 million, The Forest at number 7 with $5.8 million, The Big Short at number 8 with $5.2 million, Sixter at number 9 with $4.4 million, and The Hateful Eight at number 10 with $3.4 million. And now let's take a look at what happened on this date in entertainment history. On this date in 1975, Barry Manilow scores his first number one single with, Mon- with Mandy, who go on to sell more than 75 million records over the course of his career. At the height of Barry Manilow's popularity, none other than Frank Sinatra himself said of Manilow, he's next. Yet even in his heyday, the more youthful arbiters of cool were not kind to him. They called Manilow's music bombastic and schmaltzy, even as Americans devoured his every release. But critics may have dismissed the point. Barry Manilow never fancied himself hip or cool, far from it. He said once, I have purposely tried not to stay in sync with the times. I just do what feels good. Even as a teenager in the 50s, Barry preferred pop standards and Broadway show tunes to Elvis Presley records, and it was his love of this style of music that led to his big break. While performing as a commercial jingle writer performer and pursuing a recording career with limited success, Mallow met a kindred spirit named Bette Midler. He first became her piano player, then graduated to musical director, lending his arranging and organizing orchestration talents to her Divine Miss M album and tour. Think Boogie Woogie Booga Boy on the condition that he be able to perform a short set of his own songs during her intermission. It was this experience that landed Manilow Gig as Dionne Warwick's opening act, which in turn led Clive Davis to take him under his wing at the newly formed Arista Records. Then came Mandy, It's a Miracle, I Write the Songs, Looks Like We Made It, and a string of 21 more top 40 hits between 1975 and 1983. Hits that helped earn Barry Manilow recognition by Billboard Radio and Records as the top adult contemporary chart artist of all time. His days as a chart artist may now be behind him, but Barry Manilow continues to fill concert venues around the world with fans who in, whose enjoyment of his music seems undiminished by the jokey barbs of the pop critical establishment. And that's your entertainment report for Monday, January 18th, 2016. I'm your host, Mr. Downtown Ray Mello. I'll be back tomorrow to deliver some major stories and trends going on in the world of entertainment and beyond. You can follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, facebook.com slash the entertainment report with Ray Mello. That's R-A-Y-M-E-L-O on Twitter at the enter report or on Instagram at the entertainment report. You can listen to this episode or any previous episode episodes of the entertainment report anytime you want on iHeartRadio. Just go to iHeart.com or your iHeart phone app, search for the entertainment report, and I'll take you to the page. Good night and God bless you all.